Did we fill the coffee in the back? Yeah. Good deal, sir. Everybody's awake. Um, welcome. So we are in the uh, in-home tech uh, panel here. Uh, I'm Johnny Logan, the founder of Doctor's Choice, and today I'm really grateful to be up here with this powerhouse panel um, of thought leaders here locally. Uh, what we're going to do today is we're going to keep it pretty informal. I know there's only about 20 or so of you in the audience, and uh, what we're going to do is we're going to start off by just a quick introduction. I know that the bios um, are there in the brochures, but I'm always curious as to uh, the origin stories of how people got started in their careers and how they got to where they are today. And today's sermon, we have a, a, a very impressive panel. We have Elizabeth Roche from Zymatica. Um, we have uh, Professor Pinal uh, Mangadonia from URI. We have um, we have Marsha uh, Conrad Miller from CGI Consulting. Uh, we have Dean uh, Pat Burbank from URI College of Nursing, as well as Dr. Anita Alamont from CVS Health. Um, so we're going to get started. Uh, we're just going to go by the proximity to me. So Elizabeth, we'll start with you. you know, if you just walk us through sort of how you got to where you are today at Zymatica, um, your role, as well as um, some of the projects that you're working on. Great. Um, so my name is Elizabeth Roach. I head up the research and strategy division at Zymedica. Zymedica is a medical device design and development company. And the core of Zymedica is founded around a belief and a passion for human-centered design. Um, in fact, Zymedica was founded by two graduates from RISD. My career passion has been human-centered design and understanding the people who will use the products that we design and create. So my degree is in cognitive psychology. And I definitely believe that if we don't understand how people think, how they feel, we won't be able to create solutions that are meaningful for them in their lives. And often what we find is technologies looking for a problem rather than starting with the problem, understanding it, and then looking at the technology and saying, how can, how can we leverage this? How can we bring this together? Um, so I've spent about half my career in Germany and about half of it in the U.S. I've been in the <coughs> medical side and the consumer side of things. I have worked for big corporate companies and I have also worked for small consultancies and design companies. Um, and all of that has really culminated in bringing me to Rhode Island and to Zymatica, which is a place that I think can really make a difference in the world. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Johnny, for inviting me here. Uh, I'm uh, uh, heading a uh, wearable biosensing lab at the uh, University of Rhode Island. And uh, uh, it's very interesting. I love Jaimedica and I, I do talk to uh, uh, Aiden Petri uh, more often. And, uh, and uh, coincidentally, uh, I also uh, have a journey in Germany. So half of my career was in Germany. And, uh, so I, I did my master's and PhD over there, uh, especially designed wearable technologies, uh, especially for uh, ambient assisted living, which is, uh, uh, which is uh, a domain they have created in European Union, especially for a growing elderly population. And it started, I think, 2007. Uh, uh, they face the same problem like what we have here. Uh, and also, if we go around the globe, uh, if you go to China, India, same problem over there. So, uh, and, and uh, kind of the uh, discussions we are making, I'm, I'm sure that it will be a big impact. Uh, I have brought something, so I, I will take around two minutes to show some, I wouldn't say visuals, but they are really physical objects. So, uh, let me, I think I'll just, I, I don't think I will need that. My, my voice is quite heavy. So. Let me get started with the t-shirt, what we have designed in our lab. Uh, it was one of our uh, course projects. This is an ECT t-shirt. Uh, of course, I don't think it can fit easily to elderly uh, people, but uh, it is just a concept. Of course, it, it, it does work, and it can get you the clinical ECG data. Uh, it's not that just a heart rate. It is more about the, the cardiac information, what you need to get. So this is one t-shirt. Uh, I'm just uh, exploring uh, different different things. Uh, other thing, let me stand up. I think that would be even easier. So, 
Uh, this is a smart, so all of these are a smart uh, textile technologies, what we have designed. Uh, this is a sleeve we have created, so it goes over here. And this is especially for uh, uh, people with ALS and uh, how they can communicate with computer just through their muscular tone. Uh, and uh, I have a, uh, sorry, this, this is little little uh, dirty sock because we just finished our trial. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and we have uh, around six sensors on that. Uh, and especially we are, we are currently working on a, uh, uh, gait abnormalities for people with stroke and uh, it could be Parkinson's disease and a large portion of my research is associated uh, with uh, with Parkinson's disease right now and uh, uh, I cannot disclose but I have uh, uh, I, I have heard of good news from NSF that my career award is recommended for funding uh, so so I, I would be uh, I would be working for next five years on designing smart textiles for people with Parkinson's disease who can do the screening at home. So doctors do not they don't need to visit doctor more often. And uh, last note uh, is that about the elderly population. So it's uh, I think it is uh, about a perception. It is not about the the age itself. It's every it, the body is there. Body is going to decay. Uh, just that body, which which uh, kind of you know represents its own symptoms. Uh, it could be physical, it could be mental, it could be behavior, and uh, that's what the opportunity we have in here in Providence as well as in Rhode Island that uh, we can engage elderly population also for designing. So I, I really love the part of the the, the design thinking and. Uh, Elderly population should be a stakeholder. So when they are stakeholders, they should be co-designers. So we actually, most of these designs, what we are making, we don't design by ourselves. We work with elderly population. We ask them what the problems are. Sensors, do they feel comfortable? How should, how should we design these smart textiles? So of course, they have knowledge. They have understanding of the problem. So we really utilize that. We capitalize that in our projects. Thank you. People can try these on afterwards. Uh, <laughs> except songs. <laughs> Hi, I'm Marsha Kendra Miller. I'm with um, CGI. Which, for those of you who don't know CGI, we are a um, process and technology consulting firm. Uh, I think the fifth largest in the world, so it's we're global. Um, but part of why I'm on this panel is I spent eight years at Philips Home Monitoring which is the part of Philips technology company that focuses on uh, senior care in home and the Lifeline product. I owned the um, R&D organization where we developed our um, wearable device uh, that went mobile. So it's the device that does automatic fall detection um, and we took it to the mobile um, technology and are able to, people are able to use it outside of the home it tracks um, GPS, it tracks location, it does automatic fall detection. Um, I also uh, was responsible for our solutions that were provided to post-acute care organizations, mainly um, patient safety systems and, and patient monitoring systems. So I've spent about a little over eight years really focused on seniors and the needs of seniors. Um, the Lifeline company that was bought by Philips has been doing senior support for about 40 years. So there's an awful lot of information and knowledge that's been gained as to how do you provide support for seniors, how do you make seniors comfortable in asking for help, how do you get technologies that they're comfortable with. Um, and um, my background is I'm a, a software developer by training. I have a business degree. Um, and my role right now is to be the lead for our healthcare practice for CGI in the New England area and work with various different companies to say, how do we bring new processes and new technologies and um, help collaborations across different parts of the healthcare spectrum to come together and support people. Um, are we, do you want to go into some of the solutions we want to talk about, or do you want to hold that really? So one of the things that CGI has done recently is, is we actually have worked with a, a community, and I think this is very appropriate for Providence. We worked with a community out on the West Coast um, near the city of um, Portland, Oregon. And it was a collaboration between the fire department, the healthcare payers, the healthcare um, 
university facility and um, the transportation organization. It's a solution called FD Cares, and what they've done is they've used um, data and um, predictive analytics modeling to really determine um, how to support people who use 911 for non-emergent um, care needs. And so what they've done is they have um, different um, paths of care where they have nurses now on their EMT services. The fire department um, has the ability to stabilize people in their homes to avoid taking them to um, the emergency rooms. Also has the ability to take them to other um, areas of care, some to uh, mental health um, facilities, some to sobriety facilities. It's not targeted specifically at aging population, but certainly we know that the aging population and the senior citizen population use more um, services and more emergency services than other parts um, of the population. <coughs> and what they found is, um, and it's really aimed at the triple aim, if you will, the triple aim um, measures. Um, and what they found is um, better patient satisfaction. They've reduced the number of visits to the emergency room. They've reduced the cost of the emergency room and the cost of um, tests and things that are done in the emergency room, so blood tests and, and other types of, of things that cost the healthcare system. And they've used lower cost transportation. So they've, they've collaborated with the transportation organizations. So instead of sending an ambulance to someone who just needs to be stabilized because they need um, their medication adjusted, um, they can send out a non-emergency vehicle. And the last piece of that is they're now moving towards predicting people who need proactive visits. So they're looking at bringing proactive visits where people go out and check on people <coughs> before they call 911 or before they use the emergency services department. So we're about one signature away from being able to publish actually a case study. So if anybody's interested, if you give me your information, when we get the final you know, approval on the signature, I'd be happy to send it to you. But I think you know, communities coming together and finding that collaboration between the various parts of, of the healthcare systems is something that's um, really important that we all work together to, and that's something that CGI is very focused on working with our, our constituents, our customers, as well as just the community at large. Is that it? Thank you. So uh, thanks for inviting me. I'm really happy to be here. I'm Pat Burbank, um, Associate Dean for uh, Academic Affairs in the College of Nursing at URI. I'm a professor there also, and also a faculty member in the Rhode Island Geriatric Education Center. Uh, and I'm a clinical nurse specialist in gerontology, so my whole career has really been um, caring for and, and doing research with older adults. So you might think um, it's kind of odd that I'm here on this panel, but um, it, it kind of evolved from uh, some of my research and my clinical work and also some family experiences that I had. I, I have a, a, a wonderful, uh, very long-lived family that didn't have very many children in it, so I grew up with a lot of older adults and uh, had uh, wonderful experiences with them. So um, my two areas of research that really led me into this, uh, uh, thinking about this device, were in the area of health behavior change. Um, I had a wonderful opportunity of working on a, probably around almost 10 to 12 years with a uh, large grant that Dr. Phil Clark uh, was PI on, an interdisciplinary grant where my, my piece of it was working on the uh, physical activity and health behavior change for older adults. Um, so I've, I've been interested in that, I've done research on that piece of it for a long time. The other, um, even older uh, research of mine is on meaning in life and older adults. Uh, and I had, it always struck me that people who had a great deal of meaning in life did a lot better, even with multiple chronic illnesses, than people who did not. So um, the idea for our device really came from my, uh, my, my aunt, who at the time she was 90. She just passed away last year at 102. So when she was 90, I, I would call her up and she would never be home. Um, and, and she didn't have an answering machine, and I tried to buy her an answering machine for years, but she resisted that because she didn't want to do it. It was too complicated for her to figure out. 
So I said, you know, really, it really isn't cheap. Still resisted, so I bought her an answering machine for her 90th birthday. Showed her how to do it. She lived in Illinois. I used it her frequently. I showed her how to use it, and she loved it. And she kept playing back, because she was never home when I called, so she kept playing back messages, my messages, I keep her messages uh, every one, at least once a week. So um, in, in, when thinking about that and then looking at, at what a change, uh, trying how difficult it is to change anyone's behavior, but particularly uh, our, our group of older adults, to get them to exercise and move around more, I had the idea for um, a device that would be able to provide reminders to, for people to move. We just heard from Martin about the sitting and the smoking. Um, there's a, a lot of research that says if we're sitting, how many of us sit for an hour at a time at our jobs, right? It's everybody. Um, it's, that's, that it looks like the time period that's kind of the magic period of an hour. We're supposed to move around at least every hour. So, um, a device that would sense periods of inactivity and provide us reminders to move, but also be able to give us instructions, short exercise instructions, um, in, recorded by a loved one. So it kind of combined the health behavior uh, research and theory about how to get people to change behavior with the meaning in life, because <coughs> most people in my research Overwhelmingly, the things that people found most meaningful were other people in their lives, their loved ones. So this provided, combined kind of both of those things. So I had the idea for this device. We have wonderful resources at URI. So I went over to biomedical engineering, um, uh, Professor In Sun, and I told him about my idea. He starts writing badly, and he knows exactly what to do with it. So we. Um, went to the Intellectual Property Committee at URI. Um, they liked it. They decided to uh, apply for a patent for the idea. Um, and at that time, it was a device. Um, we uh, started a small business because I wanted to write a grant for uh, STG, Small Business Technology Transfer money, um, which we were not successful in getting. But um, um, we, had, we started a small business, of which URI is also a partner. So as we developed this, the biomedical engineering students actually made the device, we tested it, and in the time that it took to do that, smartphone and uh, mobile applications changed so dramatically that the accelerometers in them became sensitive enough for us to use it for our purposes. So now where we are with that is we're um, in the process of, of changing that um, device which provides recorded messages by loved ones uh, and measures time intervals of inactivity as well as uh, gives messages, short messages of, to exercise and specific instructions to exercise at particular times. We're in the process of converting that over to uh, an app. We were moving along with that until we lost our programmer recently. Uh, my son Ben and I um, worked on the business together, so um, that's been a real plus also. Um, so where we are now is we need a programmer. Um, there's also other, lots of other applications, as you might imagine, for a, a device or an application that can do that kind of, um, has that functionality. So that's really good. Yeah. So any programmers in the room? Yes. <laughs> Great. Good morning. Um, thanks for having me here. I'm Anita Alamand. I represent CVS Health. Um, I've been with CVS about 16 years in, in multiple roles. But my most recent role is to think about emerging technologies and strategies and product development. Um, so for those of you who are familiar with CVS here, you know of us as CVS, the pharmacy, the retail pharmacy. Um, CVS also has many other um, areas, the retail clinics, a pharmacy benefit manager, um, Caremark, the PBM, and most recently, um, the care, our long-term care pharmacies as well. Um, through all of this, one thing that is constant for us is that we touch millions and millions of consumers, um, especially older adults, and it is interesting to go back and, and look at that continuum from uh, whether you go into a retail pharmacy or whether you are in the hospital or post-acute care facilities. One of the things that we're really focused on, among many things, um, is the issue of medication adherence. 
Um, it is huge. Pharmacy is perhaps the number one used um, healthcare benefit. Um, but with that comes the fact um, that 50% of us don't take our medications the way we should be, uh, costing both um, the economy a lot of money in terms of healthcare expenditures, and most importantly, uh, from an outcomes perspective. So I've spent a lot of time in my career over the past few years really thinking about um, what is it that causes someone to not comply with their medications. And if you ask five people in the room, um, there's 10 different responses. It ranges from forgetfulness, I don't think I need it, I don't afford it, it's not convenient. And then you think about older adults who are on multiple medications, it's very confusing. Um, really, so we've been spending a lot of time thinking through that, and technology has been playing a very important part of that. So in my role, we have, um, in fact, piloted and tested many devices um, across the spectrum of why someone is not adhering. So it ranges from very simple things that you could put on your um, pill bottles to just you know click a tab that says I took my medication all the way to <coughs> devices that um, have cameras embedded in them that are in the homes um, with Bluetooth technology that can upload biometric data and information, send them into what we call our, our coaches who can then call patients. So um, across the spectrum, we've, we've looked at different devices, we've looked at different technologies, and ultimately still in, in the search of the, the right sets of things across the continuum because um, people don't just have diabetes, they have diabetes and hypertension and depression. So what might work for one condition uh, may not necessarily work across. So uh, I'm spending, my team's spending a lot of time really thinking about from the experience in the pharmacy counter all the way through um, when someone is in their home. And what's really emerging a lot for us is is this new group of caregivers. I'm one of those. Um, you know, my parents are elderly for the first time. Four years ago, my dad was in the hospital. Uh, and we come from a family of healthcare professionals. He left the hospital with so many different medications. We were confused. So if you can imagine all of us who are in healthcare sitting through, looking at a medication review chart, saying, wait a minute, you walked in with 20 milligrams of this. You're coming out with something. What should you be on? Um, it's a very complex environment, so we're really thinking about um, children and caregivers who are really regionally, geographically dispersed. How do we use technology to make sure that they can continue to provide care for their parents and the elderly? Um, so, so lots of good testing and, and, and information around technology, and we're very invested in that area. Thank you. I also think about technology. I know that Elizabeth didn't get a chance to um, tell us about Sonetica, which you know, takes some of the concept to market. So what's the kind of technologies that you're working on and that you're really excited about? Sure, thank you. Yeah, I'd love to. Um, and first, I also want to say how excited I am to see a number of themes uh, coming together here today, whether it was Dr. Romano talking about human-centered design, Warren Keane talking about human-centered design as well, and running focus groups, understanding the, the needs of people. Um, but as I think about technologies, there are two areas that, that really um, are tied to my background and my passions. One is voice design, voice interface design, which is where I really um, started my career, and I'm listening to Pat talk about uh, a voice interface, and that is one of the key areas of emerging technologies that we're seeing uh, across the board. So I'll talk about that first, and then I want to talk a little bit about neuroplasticity and the technology implications of that. Um, but on voice interface design, how many of you own an Amazon Alexa? Anyone? Okay, so it's this little, little black um, cylindrical object and it allows you to surf the internet with your voice, which is amazing. One of the very first projects I worked on at, at Sprint many, many years ago in the late 90s was um, essentially a voice activated um, app on your phone that would let you surf the internet. We didn't even call them apps back then. Um, but Amazon Alexa is the, the embodiment of that and you can ask her to order a pizza for you, you can have her put objects on your shopping list, you know, Alexa, add bananas to my shopping list. Um, my son's favorite part of Alexa is you can say, Alexa, tell me a joke. She'll tell you a joke. Um, companies everywhere are building 
essentially apps for Alexa. Amazon calls them skills, but think of them as apps. Um, Boston Children's Hospital has recently built a skill for Alexa. They've developed a piece of software that is called Kids MD, and it lets parents ask Alexa basic um, pieces of health advice. My child is running a thus and such fever. Should I be going to the hospital with them? So really beginning to see voice interface and, and health merge. One of my colleagues bought Alexa for his 93-year-old grandmother. She had never surfed the internet before, never had any interest in trying to go online. Now she's online all the time on Alexa. She's looking up recipes, she's doing conversions of, you know, I want to double this recipe, how many tablespoons are in a third cup. Um, Alexa can do all of that for you. So this has opened up a whole world for her and created a companion. So speaking of companions, we at Zymedica are constantly monitoring new products that are either new on the market, winning awards for new innovations, are, are in research. And so I looked across some of the trends we've been seeing and pulled out a few examples of voice. There's a little robot in Japan called Kirobo. And Kirobo is a little tiny robot about this big. And really its sole purpose in life is to be a companion. And it talks to you, it will hold a conversation, it's small enough that you can take it on a walk with you. And they really targeted the aging population and people who are, who are living at home. <coughs> Although they do talk about younger singles who are living at home also needing companionship, but really the primary target um, is elderly population living at home. And so another area where you begin to see voice and technology coming together to meet a real need, right? So then, Another article that we read, there's a company in Israel, I believe, partnered with the Mayo Clinic, and they have just run a test showing the clinical efficacy of being able to identify voice biomarkers that can indicate whether someone has coronary heart disease, um, autism, and Parkinson's, not autism, um, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and, and Parkinson's. And they basically can identify the onset of those ailments through these voice biomarkers. So if you see that technology coming together with Alexa, coming together with the concept of a companion device, and the ability to ask for medical advice, um, you begin to see a whole, whole ecosystem of voice um, coming together to make, to make the world an easier place for the aging population to live. My last example is a medical um, packaging that is voice activated. Almost more specifically, it talks to you. So you can talk to it, you can also just push a button and have it read the instructions. So I think about some of the challenges that um, we were hearing that, that CVS is considering where people don't necessarily understand how to take their medicine, they open up the information instructions for use, if they open it. We run studies, people open the box, there's my medical product, and there's a piece of paper in the way. So we frequently, in our usability studies, people take those that pesky piece of paper and put that in the trash, and then they start using the product, but if they even open the instructions, they don't necessarily read them. So now this is a piece of packaging that was at CES, and um, you, you essentially tap on the packaging and it talks you through how to take the medicine, how to use the injection device, whatever the product is that's delivering that medication. Um, so there's a huge revolution in the space of voice. And the other space I see is, is neuroplasticity and the awareness um, that the brain can regenerate neural pathways around damaged areas, whether that is due to traumatic brain injury, Parkinson's disease, simply aging, dementia, and leveraging healthy parts of the brain to rebuild those neural networks. Um, a product that we recently worked on at Zymatica that is on our website, so you can go on and look at case studies and read more about this. Um, but it's built on a piece of um, research showing that stimulations to the tongue can directly trigger neuroplasticity in, in the brain. So it's a device that um, has a, an electrode array on it, put it on your tongue, you do exercises assigned by your physical therapist, and you have that on your tongue delivering electrical stimulation while you're doing these, these 20 minutes of exercises, or it could even be meditation if they're trying to help more in the cognitive area than the physical area. And it has had absolutely revolutionary impact on people with traumatic brain injury and holds tremendous promise for Parkinson's and other ailments that the aging population are facing. So two, two areas of technology that are just amazing to follow. It sounds like those are huge trends that we should be taking a look at in terms of merging the day-to-day -day life of you know somebody that's aging and also the technologies that are coming down the pipeline. Actually, so this is why I wanted to 
um, sort of transition into this part of the conversation where I've, one of my passions is how do we, in, in Rhode Island, we have such a fertile testing ground for um, a lot of new technologies. We have a great demographic. It's um, a pretty homogenous uh, population that we have and everything's so local. So I wanted to focus on what you thought um, in terms of the opportunities here that we can pilot in the next you know, five to 10 years. Where do you really see um, you know, the innovations coming from? Because we have a, a pretty wild, uh, wide selection of people here from both the private and public sectors. Um, so I should need a hundred start. Um, I'd love to hear about what CBS Health is thinking about in terms of you know, the next five, 10 years, where are the real opportunities and how possibly can we apply a, a macro um, outlook to a, a micro type of uh, location? Sure. Um, you know, as I mentioned, I talked through so, some of the areas that we're looking at. Um, and I think we, we heard this concept a little earlier as well. We're really focused on um, at-home technology, aging in place, what are, so ranging from what is convenient, so as simple as, a, a, you know, I take an example of us as a pharmacy, as simple as um, delivering medication. So it's not mail, but home delivery, um, especially to seniors. That is, as you think about convenience, very easy. Most people want it. They, they may have time and want to go into the pharmacy multiple times because they have time to chat with their pharmacist. But ideally, if something as easy as bring it home, and then um, from bring it home to if I have questions about my medications, if I have questions about my condition, uh, having the ability to, to have either a device to be able to monitor that at home. So we, we did a telemedicine pilot through MediClinic, our retail clinics. Um, great consumer acceptance, just wonderful. But today the way we do it is you come into a minute clinic um, and it's usually in a minute clinic. If you're not staffed there, you, you're able to leverage someone else and nurse practitioner in another area. So we're thinking about how do you now expand that into the home so someone can be doing that for, for simple things. So I don't know if it necessarily applies um, to the aging population, but strep or pink eye for most um, very busy families to be able to do that at home. So, so a lot of the things we're thinking about is, is in the home, um, diabetes, glucose monitoring, is, we just launched um, a major pilot with that. We're able to, as you measure your blood glucose levels, automatically have those uploaded and then have real-time feedback loops back to someone. Um, your, your glucose readings are really high, consider doing this, it's very low, consider doing that. So how do you expand beyond that? We started with uh, diabetes because that is obviously very problem, um, but also expanding beyond that. Um, and then the last area we're also thinking about a lot is post-hospital um, re admission, readmission. So someone, when they leave the hospital and go back into their home, um, that 48 hours, 72 a week is the most critical time. Um, and most of hospital readmissions are related to inappropriate use of medication. So um, starting to look at even if you're not able to have someone in the home, how do we use technology to do things like medication reconciliation in home? So we're piloting almost like FaceTime technology, having someone um, be able to be in the home 24 hours after someone is discharged from the hospital to be able to do that. So some of the technologies really are focused on convenience and at home. And in terms of pilot, you know, we are always, um, if you think about the captive audience that we have, we're always looking at new technologies. We're always welcoming new, and, and we have the ability to pilot through whether it's a store or different, um, you know, channels that we have. So any uh, inventors out there or entrepreneurs in the audience <clears throat> looking for a pilot? Um, and also, I want to, that's actually a good segue because once you talk about taking care of how social services agencies are so important in, in some of the care too. So I wanted to talk about that and also I wanted to um, have Pat you now weigh in on how your real time monitoring would really fit into this. So I think um, when you think about Providence, I mean, I think there's a number of things. If you want Providence to be a you know, aging, friendly or senior friendly community. Um, one of the things I think that needs to be looked at, and there's a big movement across the United States <clears throat> to um, technically enable seniors to be internet connected. A lot of seniors, a lot of senior housing, um, especially low income senior housing, um, post-acute care, 
independent living, assisted living, skilled nursing, they're not, they're not um, indemnity. Um, there's grants out there, there's a lot of funding that's starting to happen. So if you think about housing for seniors, if you want them to be technology um, users, you gotta give them access to technology. And yes, you can um, have smartphones, and smartphones can connect through, you know, um, the, the internet, but if you're not internet, if there's not a Wi-Fi connection, then it gets really expensive really fast. So Wi-Fi enabling housing, I would say, is, is a big thing you need to think about. Um, and then we need to bring together the different agencies that support aging in place. So, um, like you said, the, uh, the pharmacy agency, you know, the pharmacy companies, the transportation um, companies, I'm talking specifically about emergency transports or transports for health. Um, types of things, bringing together the um, organizations that um, provide in-home medical care. So um, I was talking to someone earlier about the the, the, um, the home health, uh, the home, um, what you call it now? The home, the home in-home medical. Um, so people who are taken care of can get their medical care in their home. Um, there's a name for it, I'm sorry, I'm drawing a blank. But you know, bringing the doctors, bringing the nurses, bringing the, the medicine to people in their homes versus always having them come to the medical facility. Um, some of that through telehealth and telemedicine. Some of that through monitoring. Uh, I think the other thing that we need to think about is, as we think about these things, is the fact that there's so many technologies. Everybody here talked about two or three or four different technologies that they think are great solutions. I'm a senior, and especially our seniors today, who are not technology literate. Now maybe, you know, when, when all of us get to be that senior citizen, we'll be ready to say I can have six different devices and I know how to use it and I know how to connect it all. But I think we have to come together and say there has to be a hub and maybe it's an Alexa hub or maybe there's something, but there needs to be a hub that all these things interoperate with. And coming from the commercial side and coming from the medical device development side, I think organizations have to open up their interfaces. They have to open up the, um, the communications mechanisms and be able to really coexist in an environment so that people can get the supports that they need. So I'd say, you know, if there's anything that you know a group can come together, it's try to get the, the um, government agencies, the uh, healthcare agencies, the commercial organizations to really start working together much more collaboratively and less independently because you can't have you know, six different monitoring things in somebody's home and think they're going to use them all. Yeah. So you wanted me to come, comment on? Yeah, how Agile is able to possibly you know, plug into the in-home monitoring and also where a technology like that would play into uh, telemedicine and especially in terms of increasing mutation adherence uh, as well as so uh, the Agile, I forgot to tell you the name of the device, which is um, Agile stands for a, a mouthful of activity analyzer with voice guidance for individualized living environments. So Agile is really much easier. But, um, but, that, but that device is, uh, it, it, I, I told you its intended purpose, but it does have uh, many other purposes, like medication reminders that can be used easily for that. Um, it is uh, that one of the keys um, that we believe is important for that, actually there's two things. One is voice recordings by loved ones. And the second one is, uh, we also actually were starting to test it with voice um, recordings by physicians or primary health care providers. But, um, and we never had a chance to compare that with loved ones. But voice recordings by loved ones, um, and, and behavior change uh, theories that, uh, the, the, the theory that is probably the, the most uh, well-researched and the one that seems to work the best for providing uh, guidance for how to help people change behaviors of all kinds is something called the trans-theoretical model, which was actually developed at URI. And, and there's several, like including Weight Watchers, several programs use that in their uh, programming in, inherently. So having a device like uh, any of our, any of the devices that we just talked about that um, provide any kind of um, 
prompts or guidance for changing behavior, like taking medications on time or, uh, or exercising or eating well, um, changing eating patterns, any of those if you can incorporate uh, your, the research from uh, a model like the, the, the TTM into the messaging from the device, it increases the chance that it, it's going to work. Um, so our, our little Agile device had a computer interface so that um, we could, you could monitor it with monitor activity levels, for instance, with a computer. Um, our uh, uh, biomedical engineering students were also um, toying with the, uh, actually they took it to the gymnast, gymnasts in, um, down in the uh, our gymnastics team and they configured it so that it, we could measure falls um, as opposed to dropping dropping the device. What the what the actual uh, activity um, pattern looked like when someone fell because if somebody falls and you don't have a a, a, a lifeline or you have a lifeline and you aren't able to press it because you're unconscious, um, this Agile would be able to, or any fall sensor that did that, would be able to make a call or send a message that someone has fallen and it's not, and they're not able to respond. So if it was able to send a message to um, a loved one's cell phone, then you could call them. If they didn't answer, then you would call <coughs> number one. So, or you could also make it so that it contacted emergency services right away. Um, so there's. There's uh, certainly ways to make devices and apps like that um, interface with um, communication devices so that it gets messages to healthcare providers. They can bring it in uh, on their monthly or every three month visit and um, connect it to the provider's computer so they can see what's happened with activities or medications over the month. There's lots of ways to get messaging back from the devices. I also have a team up here. Uh, yeah. You can now can do this more technologically. Marjorie's going to help you market it. Yeah. He's going to pilot it and also manufacture it. it. Yeah. 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 Um, I can, I can, uh, again, show one thing. Uh, whatever we are talking, I can actually show you in live. So, uh, yeah, I'm a performer, and our lab is performer. We just do the things we, you know, we plan and right away we show it. So here I have an app. I don't think everybody can see that, but I have a number of functions over here. We call it this a wearable Internet of Things app. I'll talk a little bit about Internet of Things, what exactly it is. But what here I will go with the one of the notification, uh, one of the features. So it has several things here. One is about the mobility, other is about the uh, a speech. So you can train somebody to <coughs> speak loudly, especially Parkinson's disease patients. Uh, then we have a gateway that you can actually uh, communicate with your with your uh, physician uh, remotely. So I'll show you just one uh, one of the, uh, so here, I don't know whether you can see that. Uh, so, okay, so, so here you have a bar, if you can see the bar, and I'm going to have my tremors on, right? Do you see the tremor going up and down? So this is actually a real-time interface for them. It actually saves the data. It is connected to internet. And uh, it actually uh, also in the background does the clinical score. So if, let me stop. So it creates a graph over here. So if you know. Uh, and uh, this is just for one tram. Of course, we can do much more things that you can also take a look at the walking. You can look at the posture, whether you are standing, sleeping. Uh, there are many things we can do. So we have actually completed around uh, three trials so far. One with the Parkinson's disease patient, we had around eight patients who wear the smartwatch. They went to uh, they they went to the uh, to home and they took the smartwatch and they were trained to use the smartwatch to do the speech exercise every day. And uh, we we see a tremendous improvement in their compliance. It, it's only you know having a smartwatch over there. They were encouraged to do exercise. Uh, 
Uh, secondly, we are, I'm a, a, a currently in a, 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 I'm a collaborator with the Rhode Island Hospital. We have an NIH grant uh, for 200 participants in a, uh, it's uh, not elderly, but it is more uh, towards uh, 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 teen age kids, especially who, would, who might develop PTSD. So again, we are utilizing Internet of Things framework over there, especially in healthcare, that what we were talking about, that whether at home, uh, we don't want to give them multiple devices. If it, it would be a hub, a single hub over there, and uh, they would be communicating with that hub, right? It's it, that hub could be a television, right? So and and that's what um, you know NSF. That's what we propose that it could be anything which they are using it every day. They don't need to be trained on using some new device, and uh, and then. Uh, another part is the analytics part. So we have actually designed a fog computing uh, algorithms where uh, we deploy the system along with the, this uh, interface. So it is not only about the collecting the data, it is also about analyzing the data, which is clinically proven, right? And uh, so that's where uh, we are currently working. So I'm thinking that around five to 10 years, you know, coming back to Johnny's question, that uh, where we are. So it's about, you know, looking at in a both ways the technology would work. Will the technology be used by the stakeholders? And if it is not, then what we can do to improve the usability of that? And uh, and and third third thing is that how physicians would be integrated in this because of course elderly population, but who is making decisions for them? The clinical decision. It's a physician, right? So they should be also kind of, you know, in what normally they don't have time because I work with neurologists and psychiatrists uh, and we know that the hourly how much they cost. So uh, it's very difficult to get them on, on in, into the meeting. Uh, but I have been fortunate to get them uh, sometimes. And uh, uh, they have ideas. And, you know, uh, somebody has to go there and talk to them that what do you think that would be an interesting model to use. And, uh, and they know their patients better too. They will tell you immediately that whether they can use this kind of technology, they won't be able to use it. So they also have understanding of the, you know, uh, their patients and especially uh, those who are elderly. Actually, actually, that's, uh, okay, so we have about 10 minutes left and the next session starts at 11. So I want to give you guys uh, some time to go to the restroom and get coffee and whatnot. So um, what I want to do now is uh, we have a huge list of questions here, but I wanted to open up to the audience because I know that there's um, this conversation has been really engaging. I'm sure that you have a lot of ideas and questions. Um, the outcome of this panel, uh, despite being a phenomenal showcase, I want it to continue forward because I want this to be a platform that we can use um, to foster new collaborations here, whether it's between the panelists or between, um, as well as between the audience. So feel free to ask uh, any questions that come to mind, whether it's directly towards um, somebody on the panel or the panel in general. Um, and then, let's see, the, uh, these steps aren't very senior friendly. So um, what I'll do is, if, if you have a question, just shout it out, and I'll, I'll repeat the question, and then we'll, we'll pass it on. Yes? So you've talked a lot about connectivity and ways to monitor and analysis. To what extent do HIPAA or privacy or data protection issues shape what you're doing or, or get in the way? Oh, I, I'll jump in and then we'll pass it on to Marsha. But yes, yeah, it's, it's a great question because we, it's something that we um, face at Zymedica all the time. Medical devices today are almost by definition connected. That used to be a question, gee, should we make this connected? It's not even a question anymore, it just is. So then the next step is, wow, well, what we'd really love to do is leverage social media, connected data, etc. So you have um, HIPAA compliance genuinely, it, it, there's so many good things about it, but at the same time it does get in the way of being able to simply say, hey, what if you share data across a population who are all dealing with the same disease state, the same condition, so that they can learn from each other and they can share experiences, and what if they want to share that data with caregivers and they want to share that data with their HCPs, then you're looking at issues around transmitting data, issues around uh, storing data, and issues around collections of data points making any individual identifiable, right? If you abstract the data out and make it not identifiable to an individual, that's great, but if you get enough data points and you start compiling them, then you have the risk all over again. 
Um, so while it has many benefits, it is something that does sometimes slow down our ability to take all of that metadata, all that big data, and turn it into something that people could, could apply. Um, but there are also many opportunities uh, around it, and the clients we work with are thinking very creative, creatively about how to get the best from all of that data. Um, I would just add to that, <clears throat> excuse me, I think that um, in a lot of cases there are opt-ins, so when you sign up for a service, you know, people have to opt in for the fact that their data is going to be used and transmitted. As you said, with big data, you can de-identify it in order to use it for modeling and predictive analytics and not identify a person. And then the third thing is, there's a lot of work going on around cybersecurity and making sure that connected devices and the data that flows across those connect from those connected devices to central storages um, are, is much more um, secure. Uh, I actually just got educated on, there was a technology um, that was created by Bitcoin um, which is called uh, blockchain, blockchain um, which is a security methodology for how you don't identify, how you can transmit data and keep it much more secure. So bringing that to healthcare and healthcare data is something that you know we're looking at and starting to work on. Um, the other thing, quite honestly, is depending on, and it's not as appropriate a discussion for um, Rhode Island, but if you're in, a, in any kind of a global discussion, every country has different laws and different rules as to where you can store data, how you can store data, what you can identify, what people, whether you have to get an opt-in or you can have a blanket agreement and it's an opt-out, like, you know, when you download a piece of software and you check the I agree, in there it's, you know, you're agreeing to a whole bunch of stuff. In some places you have to actually say, I agree to share my data and opt-in. In some cases it's a button that says, no, you know, only if you check the button that says I opt out, do you not be able to use it. So there's a lot of work to be done around understanding all of that when you're bringing commercial products to market. Tom Street. Uh, all right, any other questions? In the back. Um, I'm wondering, in terms of low-income households, how does this get paid for? Um, is there a way that, because medical facilities are claiming that they're having financial difficulty, hospital system, Medicaid, Medicaid, so I'm wondering, wondering how do actually afford and access these kinds of resources? So the question was, uh, uh, how do we pay for this, uh, especially for low-income individuals, especially because a lot of the um, governmental agencies are short on funds. Uh, I'll take a yeah. stab at that. Um, so that is, that is, I would say, the challenge, correct, um, uh, in terms of who is going to pay. What we have um, seen is that especially in Medicare and Medicaid where the incentives are aligned to so whether there's either um, penalties around hospital readmissions or there are incentives around Medicare stars, for example, quality payments around making sure someone is adherent, there is a willingness to, be, to pay for these because the outcomes far outweigh the cost of um, not taking care of the issues. So in, in Medicare and Medicaid, in some cases around medication, and being able to subsidize the cost of devices in order to achieve those star levels or those quality metrics, um, we've seen more of a willingness. But you are right that that is a, a barrier for someone to pay out of pocket. Can I just say one thing first? Um, so other health insurance companies also are um, sometimes interested, like Blue Cross I know has funded Fitbits for companies because they it, because it saves them money. Blue Cross is the, is the healthcare um, the insurance provider for that company. So that insu healthcare insurers may also um, fund some of it. I just want to uh, look at from the uh, out of the box standpoint that I just came back from India. I, I run a workshop over there called the Speed Storming. And it was about the healthcare and solving the problem of the healthcare in India. I mean, India is a big country in terms of population and it is a developing country. There are lots of regions where are, these are low income families. So uh, one team came up and they actually said that. Uh, one, uh, he, he was not a healthcare worker, but he's an engineer who was deployed in an in a outskirts area to look at and survey all this. So they found out this uh, in, in very interesting model 
that the, 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 the village was interested in creating a clinic, clinic through you know, their own funding as well as the government's funding together. Right? And then uh, they wanted to bring in some uh, you know, medical technologies over there for basic medical technologies so, so citizens uh, or whoever the residents in that village would be able to get the basic care. Right? And I was thinking that it's a very good model in terms of you know, the citizens, they feel a responsibility uh, for their own village and they wanted to create uh, they wanted to create the clinic which is funded by government as well as themselves so and also bringing the technology so that's that that was a very very positive sign about you know the younger generation who was thinking about the elderly population and bringing in the clinic right Can I just, just, oh, sorry, just, I'll get right back to go ahead and just one thing and uh, comes a little bit back to the FD cares that we were talking about um, which was a collaboration between uh, Molina Health, Primera, Blue Cross, TriMed Ambulance, and the University of Washington Valley Medical Center. And so the whole objective there was to reduce the cost of health care payments that come from either Medicaid or Medicare or the, or the insurer by providing um, different pathways for, for um, medical support. And in some cases, healthcare payers are looking at these devices and these capabilities and these uh, medication adherence things and saying, if I can provide this to a low-income person and that reduces the amount of um, Medicare Advantage payment that I have to pay, there's a good trade-off there. So we need to build those business cases for the healthcare payer organizations, whether they be you know, state and local Medicaid, federal agencies, or healthcare payer organizations to really say, you know, it's, a, it's an investment that's got payback. And I just wanted to, a quick thing, as soon as I heard the question, the first thing that popped into my head is something that's come up a few times, which is um, free Wi-Fi and, and the movement that started many years ago, the internet, what was it, the internet like water, Wi-Fi like water, um, and just this idea that it should be something that is provided by the government, Wi-Fi should, should just be ubiquitously there so that everyone has the equal advantage to, to go online without having that sort of foundational barrier. If, if you can't get online, then leveraging the vast majority of what we've talked about it doesn't work. So I feel like that would be step one that I would look to our governments to, to change and to provide. That's just a very positive way to end this panel. So a round of applause for everybody on the panel.